south and certainly quite a number of showers for Scotland and Northern Ireland with some wetter weather there for Orkney and Shetland. A cooler day for many, temperatures down a few degrees, but still fairly warm in the south and humid. Then as we go into Friday, we're all into this cooler and more changeable airflow that many northern parts have had throughout the week. And that means a mixture of sunny spells and showers for most on Friday and Saturday, especially towards the north and northwest and temperatures back to average. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. Hi, I'm Dan Wooten. You can watch me live on GB News Monday to Thursday from 9pm. And did you know that you can also watch and listen live on our website, gbnews.com. You'll always be up to date on the latest breaking news, as well as enjoying the best stories, opinions and shows. You can even join the debate under our live player as you're watching. So head straight to gbnews.com on TV, radio and online. GB News, Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, I'm Michelle Jubry and this is Jubes & Co. We all now know the situation in the channel is out of control. I'm asking then, is it time to call a national emergency? And if so, what would that look like on my panel tonight? I've got not one, but two lawmakers and I'm fascinated to ask them, why has this not happened already? What about the Australians, by the way? Do you reckon they had the right idea with their Operation Sovereign Borders when they hand handed things over to the military to try and get it sorted out? And 
parking fines are going to be increased, apparently, so that they are more of a deterrent to us all. Uh, I can't help but notice, though, that many councils are struggling for cash. Are we motorists basically being fleeced and being used as ATMs to try and plug the holes in those councils, which many of them have caused by their own mismanagement? And did you see the situation around the Pride book yesterday? It was all kicking off. Uh, I'll be talking to the mum who had to withdraw her child from the nursery due to some of the content that was in that book. On the flip side, though, people are saying, calm down, everybody. It's you, the adult, that sees sexualised imagery when you see a guy in leather. Is it? You. Tell me. We've got it all coming up tonight. But before we get into it, let's get the news headlines. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. Former NatWest Chief Executive Dame Alison Rose is set to receive a £2.4 million pay package a month after quitting. Dame Alison resigned following the row over the closure of Nigel Farage's bank account, but is still working her 12-month notice period. Investigations into her actions are still ongoing after she admitted discussing personal banking details with a journalist. The company says it will continue to review her planned pay and bonus payouts based on its findings. GB News' Nigel Farage has labelled it a sick joke. My own subject access request that I put into NatWest to find out what she knew about what was going on. After 30 days, I was told, we can't give it to you, Mr Farage. It's complex. That will come back at the end of October. And so what's happened is they've agreed to give her the payout before we get the results of the inquiry. And frankly, I think the whole thing is a sick joke. A lawyer for the parents of babies attacked by convicted killer Lucy Letby says they were fobbed off by a hospital boss. The former medical director of the Countess of Chester Hospital, Ian Harvey, has been accused of shamefully failing to address their concerns. He's since apologised for not communicating more fully at the time. Meanwhile, the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, says he'll engage with the victims' families ahead of the government inquiry will ensure that the legal framework for that uh, has the full confidence of the families affected and I'll be engaging with them on that, whether that's on a statutory or non-statutory basis, to ensure that inquiry looking at issues such as whistleblowers and other actions related to this case are fully investigated. A woman and her ex-boyfriend have been convicted of murdering a man she met on a dating app. Michael Hillier told the court that he and his girlfriend Rachel Fulstow planned to attack Liam Smith after she claimed he'd raped her. Hillier admitted manslaughter but denied murder. Mr Smith was shot in the face before acid was poured over him outside his home in Wigan last year. The pair will be sentenced tomorrow. South Yorkshire Police has referred itself to the information watchdog after losing nearly three years' worth of body cam footage. The force, which discovered a significant and unexplained reduction in data stored on its computer system from July 2020, says it's deeply sorry. It's now trying to recover the footage, which could be used as evidence in court. An estimated 69 cases could potentially be affected. And a police officer has been jailed for 19 months for voyeurism. Alexander Hindmarsh, who resigned from West Midlands Police, covertly recorded men in public toilets and showers over a two-year period. The 32-year-old, who pleaded guilty to the offences, has been ordered to register as a sex offender. Experts are hailing the UK's first womb transplant as a medical milestone. A 34-year-old woman in England received the organ from her older sister and is now planning to undergo IVF later this year. The operation at the Churchill Hospital in Oxford took around 17 hours and around 50 babies have been born worldwide following womb transplants. Lead surgeon Professor Richard Smith says the operation was a huge success. I think probably the most stressful uh, stressful week of our surgical careers, but also unbelievably positive in the outcome. And the, the, the donor and recipient, uh, just over the moon, really over the moon. Well, certainly excited about the next one. I'm just really happy that we've got a donor who's completely back to normal after her big op, 
and a recipient after her big op who's doing really well on our on our immunosuppressive therapy and looking forward to getting to having a baby. Extreme weather continues to fuel wildfires in Eastern Europe. Crews have been struggling to control fires in northern Greece a day after 18 bodies thought to be migrants were discovered. Helicopters are being used to drop water on the forest fire. Hundreds of people have been evacuated from areas across the country since Saturday. In northwest Turkey, footage shows firefighters driving past walls of flames. 1,200 people have been evacuated from nine villages there. And India has become the first nation to land near the moon's south pole. The history-making Chandrayaan-3 is hoping to find samples of water-based ice on its mission, which scientists say could support human habitation. The country is only the fourth to achieve a soft landing on the satellite. Prime Minister Narendra Modi called it the victory cry of a new India. The UK Space Agency has congratulated the Indian Space Research Organization on its success. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car on digital radio and on your smart speaker by simply saying play GB News. Now it's back to Michelle. Thanks for that. I'm Michelle Jubry with you till 7 o'clock today. Alongside me, Miss Summer herself, we've just been describing her as Baroness Claire Fox, the director of the Academy of Ideas. I said you look very glamorous. You said you look very summery, and indeed you do. Uh, I definitely did not uh, look out of the window before I got <laughs> dressed today in my thick black knitted yeah, dress. Yeah, but you always look glamorous. I That's don't know what I was thinking because it is quite warm. Uh, quite warm. You didn't look out your window either. Where's your rainbow um, nice tie that you wear when it's nice and summery? Well, that is a good point. I've worn I wore a red tie today to try. I didn't realise that uh, to match his, uh, Lady, you... Lady Fox was going to be bright. <laughs> yes, my that tie. is some uh, serious coordination. You also match perfectly with your telephone case, yes. which viewers probably can't see, but there is a perfect match. Oh, there you go. Perfect match going on there as well. I like that's Daniel Moylan, uh, the Conservative peer in the House of Lords. You know the drill, don't you, on this programme? It's not just about us. It's very much about you guys at home. What's on your mind tonight? GB Views at GBNews.com is how you get a hold me or of course you can tweet me at GB News. If you just tuned in uh, it's all coming your way tonight. I want to talk about the channel crossings and whether or not there should be a national emergency in this country. I want to ask why councils keep fleecing us for cash. Is it because they are so diabolical at managing their own money? You get in touch and tell me your thoughts and also that weird uh, situation with the Pride book uh, which features a grown man uh, wear wearing leather bits and pieces aimed at four years old, that book, what on earth is going on? I'll be talking to the mum. Uh, she'll be joining me in the studio, actually, who took her child out of nursery uh, because she was so uncomfortable with the contents of that book. But tonight's top story, the boats, they keep on coming, of course, across the channel. About 19,000 people have crossed this year. And I do have to caveat that, by the way, because that's the only the people that we know of, uh, the people that we've been processing. I dread to think what the real figure is. Uh, we go around in circles, don't we? We ask what do we do about it? Uh, now, I have to say, I don't know if you saw um, some of the content that was floating around on social media now. Uh, I will play it for you just in case you didn't see it yourself. Look at this. Uh, so basically, I would call this, it's like a promotional video. Uh, these guys are advertising their journey to the UK, um, looking, well, what I would call rather relaxed and chilled uh, in a very nice uh, bed, which looks like a hotel room, uh, nice and happy, grinning away, smiling. A, a really good advertisement, actually, to anyone else that's sitting in France thinking to myself, shall I get on that dinghy or not? Now, when you've got this situation, and you are literally being laughed at, if you ask me. You've got to start looking, thinking outside the box as to how on earth you get a grip of this situation. In Australia, some would say uh, that they perhaps had figured it all out quite some time ago. They had something called Operation Sovereign Borders. Now, joining me is the former Shadow Secretary uh, General of Victoria, Australia, Tim Smith. Uh, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Just briefly, Tim, uh, you guys in Australia, you didn't declare a national emergency. Uh, but you did create a military-led operation called Operation Sovereign Borders. Just describe it to my viewers, please. 
Good evening, Michelle, and good evening to your viewers around the United Kingdom. Very simply, uh, Operation Sovereign Borders was run by an army general uh, with authority over the Navy to turn around boats when safe to do so, to return illegal migrants uh, that had come from Indonesia back to Indonesian waters when safe to do so, and to process illegal migrants offshore in Nauru and Manus Island um, in virtually all cases. And uh, if these, uh, you know, asylum seekers were found to be ref legitimate refugees, some of them made their way to Australia. The vast majority did not. The vast majority were either sent back to where they had originally come from or were uh, sent to a third country. And this worked. And I can tell you why it worked, because the Labor Party opposed this when they were in government between 2007 and 2013. They won the election last year and they haven't changed the Conservatives' approach to border security since coming to government last year. So you know when the left of politics supports a Conservative plan because it works, you know that there's no more politics in this in Australia. It's settled policy and it's bipartisan. And I just wonder what the politicians have been doing in this country, given that 45,000 people turned up here illegally last year. That figure to me is just unacceptable. Well, I think it's unacceptable to a lot of the viewers, but the answer to it really does divide opinions. So one of the key components that you had in Australia was the pushback, the turn back. Many people will say in this country that that's what we should be doing, but the second you have that kind of conversation, uh, many people immediately, and perhaps some would say understandably, because they would say their concern is to save lives in the channel, but many people would say it's inhumane to do that turn back operation, is it? Um the number one way of stopping drownings in the channel is deterrence. When Labor were in power in Australia between 2007 and 2013, 1,200 people tragically drowned making the dangerous crossing from Indonesia to Australia. What you have to do is stop people from getting on the boat in the first place. And the only way you do that is by smashing the people smugglers' business model. And that is to say that their clients, economic migrants, in many cases from Albania, will not settle in the United Kingdom. They will be returned to Albania or returned to a third, returned to a third country, which is safe, uh, and they will never, ever settle in the UK. That's the only way to do it. Now, turning back boats is a, a very good way of sending a message to future asylum seekers that you won't make it to Britain or Australia. There's, there's just one slight difference between the channel seas between Indonesia. Oh, no. He was just about to get to the the, the uh, piece de resistance. We lost him. Uh, is he there? That's an empty chair. Uh, that is a cushion, in fact. That I'm is here. definitely not Tim. Are you still there, Tim? I'm here. Yes, carry on. You I'm were just here. about to say the key I'm difference. Here. Tell me. Well, the, the key difference is that there's a few hundred kilometres of ocean between Indonesia and Australia, and I think it's 17 miles at the closest point between France and Britain. So there's a lot more... I suppose there are many more opportunities to turn boats around on the way from Indonesia to Australia than there are in the Channel. And particularly when you're dealing with French sovereign waters, and let's face it, the French are not being particularly helpful or sympathetic to Britain's situation at the moment. We had a terrific relationship with Indonesia. Uh, they accepted that what was going on uh, was dangerous, it was wrong, and they accepted us turning boats around and sending them back to Indonesia. The French, let's face it, uh, are being obstructive and indeed, I suspect, are trying to undermine British policy. Well, interesting stuff. There you go. Thank you very much. That, that's Tim Smith there with, a, with an insight what they did in Australia. Claire Fox, what I don't understand in this country is why can't we declare a state of emergency? Because in my mind, and you two are the lawmakers, so I'm sure you're going to educate me, but why, if we, if we declare, right, there's a state of emergency now, we've lost control. Every, everyone knows you've lost control. This government has lost control of this situation. So state of emergency, you can now do things, perhaps, like introduce the turn-back policies and things like that, if indeed the government wanted to do so. Well, the, the, first of all, I, I can't stand the rhetoric of the state of emergency. I mean, every time you look, there's a kind of crisis, and there's been these... Um, every council in the, in the land now seems to have declared that there's a climate emergency. 
And so I think that there's a danger that it just becomes a declaration without a policy. So that's the first thing. Do you not think it is an emergency when you've got like hundreds I, I, and hundreds I, I'm, of guys just randomly? Yeah, uh, I'm not suggesting up onto your complacency shorts. in terms of what we do about it. I'm just worried that just calling for a national emergency legislation. And the other thing is, there is a danger when you have that that then there's no democratic control over what gets done. So I, I'm quite keen on not just giving the government bit uh, uh, carte blanche to do anything. I think they could do with the laws that they have now a lot more than they are doing. I think there is um, a real problem of an ambivalence. You described it yourself about what to do. And people not, but you know, there's a kind of split in the political classes about how to tackle this issue. And I can completely sympathise with people. I watched that TikTok video. I thought it was like somebody's media project, you know what I mean? How to be a, a refugee in a day, because the, the young lads who made it, the lads that made it, really, it was making a mockery of everybody in this country who says you've got to do something about the boats, that in fact they declared how, uh, you know, exciting it was going on this adventure to get into the UK. And so I do, urge that we do something. I'm just not sure that the declaration of emergency is it. Uh, well, Daniel, this is your party. Uh, if I was Rishi Sunak and I was watching that video, I would be mortified. I would feel a deep sense of personal shame and I would sit there and I would think people are now laughing at us. Our own citizens in this country, there was a report done uh, on one of the news channels last night which shows that actually you've got people living in tents in people's gardens, yeah. uh, you've got people in temporary accommodation that are in dire straits in this country, an absolute mess. Uh, a guy I was reading was let down so badly he was eating dog food or cat food, whatever it was. And then you've got these guys in four or five star hotels high-fiving themselves. I'm just showing you some of the Brits, uh, British citizens on the screens now living in tents in 2023 in this country. I think it's an absolute disgrace and I think your government is failing them. Yeah, and I think everyone feels ashamed, not just Rishi Sunak. We all feel embarrassed and a great sense of shame at seeing videos like that. But you were right to call it an advertisement. You've got to remember, these people are being brought here by well-organised, large-scale, international, transnational travel agents. And because your government's happen, allowing it. They just happen to be illegal. And the, the, met the, the method suggesting by Tim Smith except for the turn back of the boats. Everything else he's suggested. The government has already passed a law, the Legal Migration Bill, which got approval um, in July. It's now part of the law of the land. They can do that. They can take people out of this country. They can take them to a safe country. That doesn't say Rwanda, but that would be the only candidate at the moment, but they can add other countries to the list. They can take them to Rwanda, and they can, um, uh, they can also deprive them from ever being given the right to settle in this country. Yes, but they're not Again. following through. Daniel, this is all fascinating, but no through one's following it's through. tied up in the courts. And until that's resolved, they're not going to be able to do it. Now you say, well, let's cut to the chase. Let's have a state of emergency where we ignore the court and so on. That isn't how this country works. If you want a state of emergency, you have to have an act of parliament. If you want to take the government to be given special and draconian powers to deal with an issue, there has to be an act of parliament under which they can act. We do have an act of parliament called the Civil Contingencies Act, which is available to the government if you have a real crisis, like, I don't know, like, um, you know, uh, some sort of natural disaster where the government can just sweep in and take stuff over. Whether that could be applied to this or not, I don't know. But you can't do anything in the middle of the summer when nothing's happening, and, and the government... It's got the legal mechanisms. It's not able to deliver on them. Um, do you know, I want to... Uh, I've got to go to break, but I want to come back to you on that. Uh, there's so much I want to say. I, I noticed that you immediately discounted turn back, so I want to uh, push you on that, probe you on that a little bit. And I also found it interesting that you say there's nothing we can do because everyone is off for summer. Uh, well, maybe they shouldn't mm. be off for summer. Uh, maybe they should be back in Parliament working on this issue. What do you make to it all? I'll be coming back and just touching uh, a couple more minutes on that in a couple of minutes. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we 
get out of it. Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament, but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, nah, no, nah, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello. Hello there, I'm Michelle Jubri with you right through till 7 o'clock tonight. Daniel Moylan and Claire Fox alongside me also. Daniel Moylan, we were just talking uh, about the channel crossings before the break. Uh, you immediately discounted the turn back uh, policy that Australians uh, implemented. Why? I didn't discount it. I simply said it's not included in the measures the government's taken. But Should it's it taken be? All the other measures. I don't think, for the reason Tim Smith gave, I don't think it's going to work across a narrow channel if the French aren't willing to take the boats back. So it entirely depends on the French being willing to take them back. And remember, from our point of view, this is a lot of people, this is 45,000 or whatever in total. But from the point of view of continental Europe, they've taken in much larger numbers, only a small number of which, and they, they don't regard our problem as being any worse than the problem they've got to deal with. Mm. The, the thing that I uh, do agree with you on, in terms of a sense of emergency, even if not a declaration of one, is that what I think the government should be doing is these people are arriving, they should be, as we speak, building, just like they built those emergency hospitals that we never yeah, used during the COVID, they should be building hostels wherever they need to build hostels. And actually, and they will be camps, but that will be where people would live. One of the things that's really upsetting people, and you've uh, alluded to this yourselves, are tent cities of homeless people in this country at the same, and, and the general impoverishment of people, people really panicking about not having homes, a housing crisis, at the same time as the people in hotels. Let me ask you a really quick question. Nikki, one of my viewers, uh, has asked a question that I hear often. Why is this government not just setting a migrant processing um, facility up in France? Um, <clears throat> Good question. I don't know the answer to that. But then don't they, because this is the point that Nikki... Um... But, I mean, the truth is that people wouldn't go to a migrant processing centre if they were economic refugees. Why? They've paid their money to get on a boat, and the boat is there, and that's what they'll take. Because if they know that going into migrant processing means that they're going to be turned back, why would they go that way? When by landing here, they know it's very hard for people to chuck them out. And the great thing you have to remember is, it's a very quick answer, but once you land in Britain, your chances of staying here are very, very high. If your application is being processed abroad and you're turned down, you've got nowhere, you're still abroad. 
If, you, if your object is to get here, you, you want your feet on the ground. That's what these companies, these businesses, are offering them. Feet on the ground in Britain, bit of risk, could drown on the way, but most people get through, and after that, they'll never get you out. But that's, that's one of the reasons say. why I would like the processing um, <coughs> to happen elsewhere, because then also you'd have much more of a moral argument to say you could have done the processing over there. And one of the reasons why so many people are now accepted as asylum seekers or legitimate refugees is because we've got a complete muddle about what comprises asylum and refugee status. And, many and people... anybody just needs to say, I was fleeing something. I mean, I'm being glib, but that's almost what's happened. So we've corrupted the genuine refugee and asylum status that's so important. I just think the um, uh, the the whole kind of system now has lost integrity. Yes, yeah. I, I just it think has. the yeah. whole yeah. asylum system, yeah. the whole immigration system, yeah, it's I lost agree. integrity. And I saw a statistic about a month ago, and it was saying that just for one chunk of the backlog, it was something like 75,000 or something, the particular chunk that they were focusing on, they were saying that you'd have to process a claim every four minutes in order to clear just that chunk uh, before the end of this year. You've got no chance, right. no chance whatsoever. And there'll be people perhaps watching this that say, yeah. well, hang on, Michelle, you lot are being really harsh because ultimately uh, these people have every right to try Try and seek uh, safety here if they so choose, and that there's no other routes for them to be able to safely do so, Daniel. Yeah, people do say that, but we know the fact we, we, that an awful lot of these people are um, economic migrants. Um, and, yeah. and they're here as a result of a business model that we do need to disrupt. But I also think it's not their fault. And I know that people will, you know, viewers will say, oh, for goodness sake, you've just made the point. It's the system that's corrupt. Any young person who's going to be an opportunist like that tic tac. Like, TikTok Tick lad. That's a sweet, no, but that's I, I can understand that people will be thinking, oh, you know, if I get to the UK, I'm likely to be able to stay. And it's a far nicer society than the one I'm coming from. That is not their fault. It's the system's fault in this country that's allowed the corruption of the genuine asylum and refugee status. And as you say, immigration has collapsed. I think they need to speed up the processing and be much harder about it. I had they the idea the other day, to. the triple A's, I threw it out to my audience. I had loads of people that was up for it. The asylum admin army. You could recruit all these no, exactly. people That's a that good are sitting one. at home yeah. that have left the workforce. I'm telling you now, people would come in their droves to help out and to process things. Uh, I know you would because I floated it as an idea and you all jumped at the chance. Uh, I'll tell you what uh, people are jumping at at the moment, trying to rinse more money out of motorists because uh, there's been conversations now about whether or not parking fines are effective as a deterrent at the amount of money that they currently are. Uh, councils now, perhaps I know some in London, uh, looking at whether or not uh, if you increase the sum of money, it will act as a better deterrent. Uh, I'll start with you because you are obviously advising uh, Boris when it comes to transport policy. This doesn't wash with me, Daniel. And what I think is it's not councils trying to deter someone from parking on a yellow line. It's councils that have made such a hash of their own finances that they sit there and they think, you know what, that guy there with his Fiat Punter, I can rinse him for an extra few quid and so on and so forth and I can fix my financial woes. Well, Michelle, I have to admit that even before I worked for Boris, I chaired the committee for London councils, which actually is now looking at this. I raised parking fines myself when I chaired that committee. Uh -huh. And I do think you have to say that um, fines uh, do probably need to keep up with inflation. And TfL increased the fines on their roads last year, and it looks to me like London Councils is now considering catching up with what TfL is charging for borough now that for their borough roads. Um, but I do think that I, uh, you, there is a great element of truth in what you say, that um, there, there is a war on the motorist, and the raising finance has become a driver in this. Um, I don't think it's too much a matter of yellow lines because nearly everybody knows if you park... They know what a single yellow line is, they know what a double yellow line is, and they know what they're doing, and if they get a fine, they probably just accept it. But what worries me is that setting up box junctions, yellow box junctions and things like that, and catching people, some junctions making a million quid we've seen and so on, uh, in the course of a year, this really is fleecing the motorist. Indeed. And it isn't the level of fines, it's the, it's the approach of trying to... Claire Fox? Them. What's most distressing about this is this awful policy called an active travel policy. Now, this is different than just ripping off the motorists. This is called active travel. Let's make uh, policies that nudge people and force people to walk more and cycle more and get out of their cars. And I'm afraid that both the Conservative government 
and then the, all of the councils of all shapes and tri have signed up for this. So that's the war on the car, right? Yes, but then people might shout at the screens. But what about climate, uh, Claire? They will say it's a noble uh, endeavour to try and get people out of the cars and onto the feet to help. Well, first of all, longer. if you want to save the climate, you have to convince the citizens of this country that that's more important than being able to drive. You can't force them out of their cars by having a war on cars. I mean, it's not a war on climate, it's a war on cars and... As we know, people are suffering. The ULES charge has been well rehearsed on this show. I'm not going to go through it. But the low traffic neighbourhoods, all of these completely bonkers schemes, 20 mile an hour driving, is basically designed to irritate the life out of people so that they won't drive. That's not the same as a democratic decision by the country to abandon cars. It's a behind the scenes way of doing it. So I just think that's why we've got to seriously oppose this, uh, these kind of policies, absolutely. Uh, right, fascinating stuff. Are you a motorist? Do you feel fleeced? Get in touch and tell me. Or are you on the flip side? You're a cyclist or whatever. <laughs> you say it is all fair. Get it out of those motorists. Get them out of their cars. Give me your thoughts. But I need to cross back to the news desk for some breaking news. Yes, thank you, Michelle. Russia says Wagner boss Yevgeny Prigozhin may have been killed in a plane crash north of Moscow. It's understood nine others were on board the plane, which was en route to St. Petersburg at the time. TASS news agencies reporting there were seven passengers and three crew members on the flight with Prigozhin's name on the list. Uh, we'll bring you more on that developing story as we get it. Thanks, Michelle. Cool, blimey. Big news there. And I have got the perfect panel to just reflect on that in a couple of minutes. Uh, let's reflect the, the weather in this country first. That warm feeling inside. From Boxed Boilers. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there, it's Aidan McGiven here from the Met Office with the GB News forecast. Showers for many of us over the next 24 hours, even across southern areas where it has been relatively warm and fine over the last few days, it's going to turn cooler as low pressure starts to sink south. As that happens, some intense heat over the near continent will spark some thunderstorms through the evening and overnight, those affecting northern France. But some shower activity could just spread into southwestern parts of England and then eventually other parts of the English Channel coast overnight. Some heavy rain also affecting much of central and northern Scotland. In between, a lot of cloud cover and a warm night for many, especially towards the south. But it's in the south where we're going to see some lively activity first thing, some heavier rain predominantly, with the thunderstorms that develop across northern France generally staying around the Channel or across the near continent. Much of that moves out of the way, but still some showery rain for the southeast into the afternoon. Heavy rain moves through northern Scotland, replaced by showers. Showers also affecting Northern Ireland. But actually for northern England, West Wales, southwest England by the afternoon, plenty of fine and bright weather to come. Feeling a bit cooler, and Friday's certainly a cooler day across the UK. Low pressure will bring a northwesterly airflow, a bright start to the southeast, but elsewhere a lot of showers coming through on a brisk northwesterly breeze. In between some sunny spells and a similar setup for Saturday, a mix of sunny spells and showers, and cool for many. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Well, that was the weather. Lots of you getting in touch about the migrant situation. There's a great deal of support for people uh, as well, saying that there should be a national emergency. Philip, though, he says it very succinctly. He says the government has failed uh, the British public on this matter. Uh, keep your thoughts coming in, gbviews at gbnews.com. But you did just hear uh, the very shocking breaking news there about the Wagner boss apparently potentially dead because of a plane crash. We will be responding to that in a couple of minutes. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
the Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families we have arguments every now and then but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back, we're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, Michelle Drew. We're with you till seven o'clock tonight alongside me, the Baroness Claire Fox, uh, Fox, the director of the Academy of Ideas, and Daniel Moylan, a Conservative peer in the House of Lords. I just want to respond, though, to that uh, news that just broke about the leader of the Wagner Group, uh, Evgeny Prigozhin. Remember him? Uh, one of the most famous hot dog sellers. Uh, he started his career. He became known to us all, didn't he? Perhaps June time for a very peculiar coup that wasn't a coup that all got very complicated and heated. He uh, is on a passenger list apparently for a plane, uh, a private plane that has crashed. So I have to say, we don't have official confirmation that he has boarded the plane. Um, so we can't, we don't know whether or not he's died or not, but he's certainly on the passenger list that's boarded, that was supposed to have boarded that plane. What do you make to this? This is big news. Well, you've got to remember this is a state, Russia is a state, which would send two people all the way to Salisbury to kill one of the state's enemies. Mm. Um, at considerable risk, because these guys, these two guys might have been caught, they might have been uh, picked up somewhere along the route, um, and then take risks in order to kill their enemies. So you immediately think, if this is true, and Prigozhin was or was meant to be on the plane, uh, that this is not um, an, an obvious accident. It doesn't mean necessarily it was Putin because he has even bigger enemies uh, in the shape of uh, Gerasimov and Shoigu, the two, the general and the, and the defence minister he, was try he said his coup was aimed at and his coup failed, failed to get rid of them. That's the point. Not only did he call it off, but he didn't get rid, he didn't kill the two people. He didn't finish I know, off I remember it all the two unfolding. people he was, it was trying to get rid of. It was incredible. And, and then it doesn't require a great deal of meddling with a plane to leave it in a position where it, uh, in flight, is going to crash. Well, he, he kind of, after that that odd coup that wasn't a coup that was very ineffective, whatever it was, he went over to Belarus, didn't he? There was a bit of a deal, uh, if my memory serves me quick there. Lukashenko was involved brokering that. Uh, and many people at that point, you were sitting there going, I'm not really sure how long this guy uh, is going to lead a very safe existence. Uh, it seems perhaps not long at all. Well, it, there was great speculation then that if you were going to declare a coup and not see it through, that you're, um, you're, you were going to be on somebody's target list. I mean, I can't imagine sort of thinking when I got on the plane with him, 
I might have been nervous if I'd seen his name on the passenger list. That's the point I'm making. But it's obviously quite a serious issue, this, because one of the reasons why that coup apparently happened was the incoherence of Russia's military strategy, the fact that Putin is being forced to use um, um, these kind of people who are bought uh, and for hi guns for hire and so on, is a very unreliable, it's not kind of like a national mobilisation of troops. And so I think the kind of general falling apart nature of that, which is what the coup represented, and now these kind of cloak and dagger, somebody being assassinated and so on and so forth, sums up the way that we really do feel as though Russia has become a state that's no longer part of the modern Western... I mean, you can say, well, we didn't, we knew that already, but it's, it's, it's got all of the features of a, a state that's not part of the democratic world at all, um, which we already know because of their treatment of Ukraine. But one of the challenges in all of this is um, one of the first casualties in war is the truth, isn't it? So one of the challenges in this whole situation yeah, no, that's true. is trying to work out what, what is going on, who is doing what, what is actually truth, what is actually propaganda, what we have been pushed to believe, whereas perhaps there's something alternate uh, going on over here. It's very kind of tricky to work out what is what. Well, it's made worse in the case of uh, Russia because Kremlinology, I mean, what is going on inside the Kremlin is something we've never really mastered for the last... 40 or 50 or 60 years and people uh, even in the, in the Cold War used to be paid you know salaries in order to try and work out what was happening behind those walls and we still don't have a very clear idea I can't help mentioning there is a, a an, an exact historical precedent to this in the 17th century during the 30 years war when the Holy Roman Emperor murdered uh, a man called Wallenstein who had a huge private mercenary army simply because he'd got too powerful and was thought to be threatening even though he was working for the for the emperor and but he had him killed anyway because he was too much of a threat it's it, we, this is it, it is true claire this is not modern europe this is 17th century yeah. europe this is what we're seeing nothing I, has changed i'd just like to point out that gb news is a place to go for your big history lessons where yes. you're going to learn stuff Definitely. i'm like listening a uh, mouth open thinking oh isn't he interesting he knows all about this sort of thing oh we have all, i don't we have all uh, the top brains <laughs> what can i say um but actually if you remember when you uh, think back to the start of this conflict um there was all this talk about what what uh Russia ridiculously call a special military operation, I think is uh, the, the terminology that they started using uh, when they invaded Ukraine in this way. I think they envisaged, or a lot of the conversation at that time was that they thought they'd be in, they'd be kind of uh, taking over, and then off they'd go within, you know, into the uh, sunset of glory, and it'd all be really quick. Well, this has all gone horribly wrong for Putin, hasn't well, it? Well, it's gone completely horribly wrong for Putin, but it's also the case that for those of us who have absolutely unapologetically supported Ukrainian self-determination and against the invasion, we can also say, and this is one of the confusing things at the moment, that there's an awful lot of people who have jumped on the bandwagon, of, as it were, of the Ukraine war. So one of the things that I find very difficult is the way that America's using it for its own ends. I mean, there is, it has become something of a proxy war Definitely. for the West, right? Definitely. And, but it's then been you've that got... for a while. Though. No, I know, but it's also genuinely the Ukrainian people fighting for their sovereignty and their self-determination against an invading army. So you don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater, but what, therefore, we have is even more, obs uh, you know, confusion about what the truth is, that oh. point, because we don't even know from the Ukrainians' point of view who's bought, you know, the well, everything... Of course, because their media outlets were shut exactly. down there as well. Do you know exactly. what? This is so a conversation that will go on and on. What exactly uh, has happened, time will tell, but no-one really put a long uh, life expectancy on the Wagner boss, did they? Uh, get in touch with all your thoughts, but uh, when I uh, come back from the break, I want to come back to matters closer to home. You will have seen the book, the Pride book, that's been featured a lot in the news for all the wrong reasons. I'll be discussing that after the break. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel.
Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, Michelle Jubri. With you till seven, Baroness Claire Fox, the director of the Academy of Ideas, alongside me, as is Daniel Moylan, the Tory peer in the House of Lords. Now, you might have seen uh, lots of the news agenda yesterday was dominated by a children's book. It was all about uh, a pride festival and parade, but there was a key detail in it which had really upset a lot of people. It featured uh, imagery of a man in what I would certainly call bondage gear. I think, um, you know, if you're faint-hearted, you might not want to look at the graphic now because I will show you it. Anyway, uh, this was actually used in a nursery school and there was a family in Hull uh, that really expressed concerns about this and the upshot of it was that they've now removed their child, their four-year-old daughter from the school. Uh, Marie Taylor, who's the mum of the child, joins me now. Uh, Maria, thank you for coming along. Uh, I think I've explained the context and many people will be familiar perhaps with this story, uh, but you were told about this book, uh, you raised concerns about it and then the response that you got from the nursery concerns you didn't it why it it concerned us because the initial response was to defend the images mm -hmm. and the nursery staff said that children would not perceive the images as being erotic they said only the adults they said only us would see them as erotic and that was our opinion but the children wouldn't see the images as erotic and that really concerned us because just to be clear it's not up to the child um, if the child lacks understanding of, of a subject, it, um, there's no justification to start showing sexualised images See, to I the children. Yeah, because I, I find this defence, because I have heard this defence a lot, that it's the adult that looks at that and sees a, a sexualised image, a child will just see some guy wearing a black outfit. But that excuse doesn't wash with me, because you wouldn't let a child go into a shop and take some sweets without paying just because they wanted them, because they don't understand the concepts of stealing. Uh, you wouldn't let a child, I don't know, drink alcohol because they don't understand the concept of alcohol. So I do not understand that as a defence. It seems very, very odd to me. Um, so then what was the upshot? What was the upshot? What did the trust say? And well, as a result, we raised a complaint, a safeguarding complaint, and the trust investigated it. And after several weeks, they contacted us, and the trustees agreed that the images were not age-appropriate. 
and the book has been removed from the nursery. Yeah, which is great, by the way, and I think it should have it been. Is. It um, is. But in their letter, they also said the book is available to many other nurseries across Cull and across the country, country, and it's also in libraries. Claire Force, let me just bring you in. If you ask me, I think there is this weird obsession at the moment, and I think it's deeply inappropriate um, for... Adult, um, adults within the educational settings, whether that's schools or now we're seeing nurseries, that seem to be wanting uh, to expose children to what I would call overly sexual uh, imagery and concepts. And what, do you agree with me and why? So part of the carelessness that comes on the back of just adding on to the LGB, the TQI plus bit, which is a kind of set of, so, you know, lesbian, uh, gays and bisexual uh, people are something that, of course, young people are going to be uh, introduced to over a period of time. But now there's become a politicisation of this with the, L with the TQI+. And what they're doing is normalising what are adult activities, often, as they would say, queer activities, sexual practices, which adults are free to do if they're legal that's up to them but these used to be private and they're normalizing it to kids it is actually the case by the way that four-year-olds wouldn't go oh that's bondage gear and i you know bdsm they wouldn't know what it was but therefore what is it doing in a book for four-year-olds and the reason why we should be worried about it is because what it says is young people should get used to seeing images like this because this is normal part of life but actually it isn't I have got no objection to people indulging in sexual fetishes that are legal in the privacy of their own home. Of course, that's up to them. They're adults. But the Im absolute implosion of this happening in school books, all in the name of saying, oh, yeah, well, that's because we're liberal and progressive and we support lesbian and gay rights. It's insulting to lesbians and gays, by the way, to drag them into this whole thing. But what about people, though, Daniel, that would say, well, hang on a second, because uh, we want children to be open-minded and tolerant and all the rest of it, so the sooner that we, um, you know, introduce these concepts that are such as, you know, some families have got two mums, some have got two dads, whatever, so as soon as you introduce those concepts, the less likely people are to be bullied uh, in later life. Yeah, well, that is a form of indoctrination, though, isn't it? And it's a question of what is age-appropriate and what, where children can make choices for themselves. And I think you're talking about people at the age of four. Surely what we've always tried to do is preserve an element of innocence in the, on the part of very small Absolutely. children. Um, uh, so that when they're older, of course, they have to encounter things uh, that are more complex in life. That might be more appropriate. I think in this case, to be fair to the school, they behaved quite well. They, 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 they did defend, they made the decision and they defended it, but then they did listen, the trustees did listen to what the parents had to say, and well done, Maria. And it is parents who should be in charge of these things. I've said this on your show several times. It's parents who are in charge of char children's education, and they did respond. So I think to be mm. fair they, to them... They did respond, but There are worse you, cases. When, was mm -hmm. that, when did that response come? It, several weeks, took several weeks for, for a response so to had come. The, so had the media kind of interest started by then, or was the two separate? No, because we only contacted the media after we'd received the response. Right. And we, our concern right from the start, and I said this to, to the nursery staff, staff right at the beginning, is that the, the concern is the sexualised images. It doesn't matter who's in the images, whether it's, you know, men or women, straight or gay, but if they're dressed in, in, in bondage gear, in you know... It should not be in a kid's book, simple uh, as. And, and also, if you were to dress like that in yeah. public, uh, well, you would be arrested for a public order offence if you were, you know, at a playground or in the street. Or if you came to nursery to pick up your child dressed like that, yeah. then, um, perhaps, you know, social services will get involved and you wouldn't... You just wouldn't do that. So it's about the, the sexual wear, you know, the, the, the bondage wear that's, that's in the book. It's about those images. They don't bring anything to the book. Um, it's just, but then I think, well, what goes through your head as, an, as a children's author? Because well, this book, to be clear, everyone, it's aimed at four, uh, age four plus. Anyway, I do just need to... Uh, the nursery did respond, saying that they've removed this book and they are now confident that people that attend uh, Genesis Nursery are not exposed to sexual or erotic images. Anyway, this conversation will go on and on. I would personally I encourage very, all parents... One last call, though. Very, all, very quickly. Very, very last call to, um, to all parents across the country. Now, um, this book is out there in nurseries and schools and also um, primary schools have got materials like that. We all need to go 
and mm, um, contact, speak to teachers, speak to schools and ask to see the books and the materials that are being taught at nurseries and primary schools. Yeah, so. absolutely. That is a great note to end on. I completely echo it. Uh, absolutely insist that you understand and that you see what your kids are being taught at home. I completely agree. Claire, um, Daniel, thank you for your company tonight. Maria as well for yours too. Thank you at home. Have a good night. Don't go anywhere. Nigel's up next and I'll see you tomorrow and night. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Hi there, it's Aidan McGiven here from the Met Office with the GB News forecast. Showers for many of us over the next 24 hours, even across southern areas where it has been relatively warm and fine over the last few days, it's going to turn cooler as low pressure starts to sink south. As that happens, some intense heat over the near continent will spark some thunderstorms through the evening and overnight, those affecting northern France. But some shower activity could just spread into southwestern parts of England and then eventually other parts of the English Channel coast overnight. Some heavy rain also affecting much of central and northern Scotland. In between, a lot of cloud cover and a warm night for many, especially towards the south. But it's in the south where we're going to see some lively activity first thing, some heavier rain predominantly, with the thunderstorms that develop across northern France generally staying around the Channel or across the near continent. Much of that moves out of the way, but still some showery rain for the southeast into the afternoon. Heavy rain moves through northern Scotland, replaced by showers. Showers also affecting Northern Ireland. But actually for Northern England, West Wales, Southwest England by the afternoon, plenty of fine and bright weather to come. Feeling a bit cooler, and Friday's certainly a cooler day across the UK. Low pressure will bring a northwesterly airflow, a bright start to the southeast, but elsewhere a lot of showers coming through on a brisk northwesterly breeze. In between, some sunny spells and a similar setup for Saturday. A mix of sunny spells and showers, and cool for many. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles.